Well, good morning. Hope you've had a wonderful week and are glad to be in the Lord's house today. I am glad to see you today and uh, am excited to, uh, to worship today, so we'll have a good day today. As we begin, again, we've got a couple of announcements. We don't have many, as you know. Uh, most of our church functions right now are kind of uh, are just uh, starting back up. But uh, if you look at your bulletin, you'll notice a few announcements. First of all, we are collecting money for the Father's Day offering. That is our June offering. But we're still collecting for the Mother's Day offering. We didn't quite meet our goal, which is understandable. We didn't have church during May. And so uh, if you haven't given to those and would like to know they go to a good cause. Also, I just want to remind people about checking sermon audio. Uh, We're putting sermons up there through the week. We had a Wednesday night sermon. It was actually one we preached last fall. Uh, So I'm just throwing some sermons up there from time to time, re-recording them. And uh, what a week we had. Um, This past week, I think both of our sermons, uh, our two sermons we put up, I think the one Monday had 470 listens, and the one I put up Friday morning had over 500 listens. We made the, uh, I think the top 25 sermons for yesterday. Uh, So we're having a good week, so just keep checking there and keep keep listening. And uh, uh, I think we'll have another great report this month. I'm seeing on the daily pipeline, we're getting listens from all over the world. So um, I think we had Kuwait for the first time yesterday. So uh, it's pretty interesting. But anyway, so keep that in mind and just keep in mind uh, praying for one another and seeing how we can uh, serve one another. And as we begin, we want to begin with our psalm for the day. It's Psalm number 10. And the psalmist asks, Why do you stand afar off, O Lord? Why do you hide in times of trouble? The wicked in his pride persecutes the poor. Let them be caught in the plots which they have devised. For the wicked boasts of his heart's desire. He blesses the greedy and renounces the Lord. The wicked in his proud countenance does not seek God. God is in none of his thoughts. His ways are always prospering. Your judgments are far above, out of his sight. As far as his enemies, he sneers at them. He has said in his heart, I shall not be moved. I shall never be in adversity. His mouth is full of cursing and deceit and oppression. Under his tongue is trouble and iniquity. He sits in the lurking places of the villages. In the secret places, he murders the innocent. His eyes are secretly fixed on the helpless. He lies in wait secretly as a lion in his den. He lies in wait to catch the poor. He catches the poor when he draws him into his net, and so he crouches. He lies low, that the helpless may fall by his strength. He has said in his heart, God has forgotten. He hides his face. He will never see. Arise, O Lord. O God, lift up your hand. Do not forget the humble. Why do the wicked renounce God? He has said in his heart, you will not require an account. But you have seen For you observe trouble and grief to repay it by your hand. The helpless commits himself to you. You are the helper of the fatherless. Break the arm of the wicked and evil man. Seek out his wickedness until you find none. The Lord is king forever and ever. The nations have perished out of his land. Lord, you have heard the desire of the humble. You will prepare their heart. You will cause your ear to hear to do justice to the fatherless and the oppressed, that the man of the earth may oppress no more. Amen. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you, Father, for the opportunity to gather together as your people in this place. What a precious gift that is. And Father, as we gather today, we pray that we would lift high the name of Christ, that all of the concerns that we deal with day by day, although they may be important, um, we pray that they would slip away for this time as we come together to worship our King. Father, help us to do that today. Move in our hearts by the power of the Spirit. Help us to be a thankful people, a joyous people, a people who realize the blessings that we have in Christ, and help us to sing in honor and glory of our great King. It's in His name we gather and pray and for his everlasting glory. Amen. Good morning. If you would, please stand as we sing our first song this morning, which is Amazing Grace, 
which is hymn 89 in your Hymns of Grace hymnal, and we will sing verses 1, 3, and 5 of hymn 89. singing is hymn 403. It is Blessed Assurance and we'll sing all three verses of hymn 403. Heavenly Father, what a blessing and joy it is to be together this morning in this place as your people. 
Father, we come now to the part of the service where we give back a portion of the blessings we've received from your hand. And Father, we know that you call for us to give a portion of it back to support the work, uh, the gospel work in our community and our church around the world. And so, Father, we come in obedience this morning to give that back to you. For we know that all that we have comes from you. So, Father, we love you and we praise you this morning. We make this prayer in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. We come now to our time of catechism, and it's in your uh, bulletin this morning, so you can follow along there. Uh, but as we've been thinking about uh, God and what it tells us about God, we come to this question of how did God create man? Our tenth question, and I love these answers. They're really concise ways of memorizing these truths. So how did God create man? God created man, male and female, after his own image, in knowledge, righteousness, and holiness with dominion over the creatures. Amen. We now come to our scripture for today. It is found in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. It should be very familiar to you. We looked at it last Sunday. Uh, we'll be back there again today. And Paul writes to the church at Thessalonica, But I do not want you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning those who have fallen asleep, lest you sorrow as others who have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so God will bring with him those who sleep in Jesus. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will by no means precede those who are asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, and with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and thus we shall always be with the Lord. Therefore, comfort one another with these words. Amen. Thank you. 
If you have your Bibles, be turning to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. Now we started this text last Sunday morning, and uh, we spoke about a lot of the background of what's going on. Uh, we spoke about a young church in the faith, a very young church, almost like an infant church, a few months old. Many young believers, not a lot of maturity in the church, although you wouldn't guess that by their actions, would you? They're a church on fire for God. They're moving. They are evangelizing. They are showing their love for one another. They are growing in their faith. And there are many things that uh, they are doing extraordinarily well. In fact, so much so that it would almost make us wonder how our established churches don't do well by comparison. Here is a a church that is young and on fire for Christ. But there are some things that Paul wants them to think about. He says, what you're doing, continue in. Abound more and more in what you're already doing. But there are also some warnings, aren't there? Be careful about sexual immorality. Paul says it's a great danger to the church. Beware of it. And he was speaking to a pagan culture that was uh, very much uh, over-sexualized, hyper-sexualized, very much like our own culture today. So Paul was saying there are dangers here. Watch out for them. And continue in brotherly love, loving one another as Christ has called you to do. But then as we saw, he comes to this question beginning uh, with verse 13. There's been a question in the church about uh, the return of Christ. Paul emphasized this, as he often did, as an important hope that we have, expectation that we have. And yet somehow the Thessalonian believers had come to understand that this was a hope for the living in Christ. In other words, those who were alive at Christ's return would be translated or called up, caught up into the sky, and they would meet with the Lord and forever be with Him. But as Paul had left and certain of the community had died, 
people began to wonder what happens to them. What is their fate? Uh, of course, God can call up the living into the air, but what about the dead? Have they missed out? And I don't mean to laugh at this, but if you think about the power of God, how do you think death's going to be an obstacle? But they thought it was. They were concerned that it was. And we could overcomplicate this by looking at uh, apocalyptic literature, which might have been part of the reason they thought this. But there may have also been some Gnostic teaching going on uh, that spoke about the soul having to be separated from the body while yet it was still alive and this sort of thing. Whatever the case, there's a question. What of those who have died? Have they lost all hope? And I tried to make the point last Sunday, this is not an academic question, is it? If it's your child that's died, if it's your spouse or father or mother or loved one that's died, you care very much about the answer to this. Have they missed out? Or will they be included in the promise? Paul answers it, doesn't he? He says, I don't want you to be ignorant concerning this, brethren, concerning those who have fallen asleep, lest you sorrow as those who have no hope. We spoke about this. There was a concern that Paul had that the testimony of the church was being hurt by their mourning as if there was no hope or expectation of resurrection for those who had died. Paul says, For if we believe that Christ died and rose again, even so God will bring with him those who sleep in Jesus. <clears throat> For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will by no means precede those who are asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, and with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and thus we shall always be with the Lord. Therefore, comfort one another with these words. Amen. Now, last Sunday we began to talk about this, didn't we? We began to talk about the hope that this should be for all of us, but certainly was for the Thessalonian believers. And I said then there were some interesting details in the story that we would look at today, and so we're going to do that. We're going to look at a little more detail, but the first thing we need to recognize as we do that is the initial question that Paul is answering is not, can you give us every detail of the coming of Christ, every little stance on every aspect of eschatology? That isn't Paul's concern here. Paul's concern is to answer a pastoral question. And that question is, have the dead lost out on the hope? So Paul is answering that. There are details there that we want to look at, though. And so we're going to take a deeper look today. This morning, as we do so, I want us to consider the following two points. First of all, the apostles' primary pictures. Paul has a couple of images he's trying to get across to us in this discussion of Christ's return. And second of all, that day's audible announcement. It's clear that Paul is trying to strike us with the fact that there are sounds that he is associating with that great and glorious day. So getting started first with this idea of the apostles' primary pictures, uh, there are two points I want to make very quickly. First of all, that we have to give up any idea that Paul is going to give us a systematic theology of eschatology here. That's not Paul's purpose. In fact, the reason we have so many questions about the second coming is Nowhere in Scripture do we find a systematic approach to the return of Christ. There are places and details, and we can systematically put them together and try to come up with a picture of what it all will be. But Paul is far more concerned that you're ready when it happens. That seems to be Paul's concern, is that you're ready, you're not caught asleep when Christ returns. So if we're looking for Paul to answer all of our questions, we're going to be disappointed uh, in 1 Thessalonians this morning. But we shouldn't look for that. We should look for Paul to answer the question that he's actually answering, which is about the dead in Christ and how they will be raised as those living when Christ returns shall be raised. So we want to look at that. Second of all, the other thing we want to remember as we look at this is that Paul is telling us some of what we can expect on that great and glorious day. And that is a promise, like I said, for all believers throughout the history of the church, that when Christ returns, there will be the dead in Christ, and there will also be some living uh, at the time. And so we are told this over and over. So some generation of the church needs to hear this message. We know all generations need to hear it because the truth is we don't know when that day is coming. 
And so we need to be prepared. So let's look at what Paul gives us as the pictures of that day. There are two primary pictures that Paul is building on. First of all, a Hebrew or Jewish picture of the day. And we're going to look at that. You might think of this as the day of the Lord. In Jewish uh, apocalyptic literature throughout the Old Testament, you see this thing, this coming day of the Lord, the day of the Lord's visitation. Now, it's interesting because if you just move forward a few verses into the fifth chapter, look at what it says there. Now, we're not uh, going to uh, do an exposition of this today, but I just want you to see that it's here. But concerning the times and seasons, brethren, in other words, what's the timing of this return? He says, you have no need that I should write to you, for you yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so comes as a thief in the night. In other words, you know I don't need to give you more detail because we don't have them. That day will come, will we'll be as a thief coming in the night. You do not know the time. A thief doesn't announce when he's coming. Well, the Lord hasn't announced when he's coming. But Paul will tell us that we are to be prepared, that there are things that we can know, things that we can do to be ready. And so we should always be prepared for his coming. But notice there that he's talking about the parousia or the coming of Christ. And he also connects it to this day of the Lord, this Old Testament Jewish Hebraic terminology, the day of the Lord. And that is built up in the Old Testament. And uh, we could go many places to look at that, but I'm going to ask you to turn to only one. Exodus chapter 19. In Exodus chapter 19, starting at verse 10, as this uh, incredible appearance of the Lord at Sinai is about to occur, listen to what the Lord tells Moses starting in verse 10. Then the Lord said to Moses, Go to the people and consecrate them today and tomorrow, and let them wash their clothes, and let them be ready for the third day. For on the third day the Lord will come down upon Mount Sinai in the sight of all the people. You shall set bounds for the people all around, saying, Take heed to yourself that you do not go up to the mountain or touch its base. Whoever touches the mountain shall surely be put to death. Not a hand shall touch him, but he shall surely be stoned or shot with an arrow. Whether man or beast, he shall not live. When the trumpet sounds long, they shall come near the mountain. So Moses went up or went down from the mountain to the people and sanctified the people, and they washed their clothes. And he said to the people, Be ready for the third day. Do not come near your wives. Then it came to pass on the third day in the morning that there were thunderings and lightnings, and a thick cloud on the mountain. And the sound of the trumpet was very loud, so that all the people who were in the camp trembled. And Moses brought the people out of the camp to meet with God. And they stood at the foot of the mountain. Now Mount Sinai was completely in smoke, because the Lord descended upon it in fire. Its smoke ascended like the smoke of a furnace, and the whole mountain quaked greatly. Now, this is imagery that all the children of Israel knew. They all knew the story of God and Mount Sinai and the giving of the law. And yet, look at the number of parallels between what Paul is talking about in 1 Thessalonians 4 and what we see here. The Lord coming to His people. They are to remain and prepare for His coming, to be found ready when He appears, not to be found not ready when He appears, and to wait for the sound of the trumpet, and then the people shall walk up to the Lord. Now, there are some differences. There's no doubt about that. If you compare the two texts, there are differences. For one thing, we don't walk up the mountain to God, do we? When Christ returns, He calls us up. He catches us up. He raptures us up, if you will. And so we see here similarities, but not exact uh, equivalents. But again, there are these things of clouds and thunderings and sounds and trumpets and gods appearing before the people and the people being called to God. So certainly this would have been in the minds of uh, many of those who were hearing this. Certainly it was in Paul's mind. Now, we could go through the Jewish literature, the apocalyptic literature, the Old Testament books, and you will find other similar references to the day of the Lord and the coming of the Lord and trumpets and the Lord coming in judgment and in glory and in power and in salvation. We could look further at other images that we find here. 
archangels, shouts of the command of God, trumpets sounding, clouds rolling, all throughout the Old Testament. Whenever you see a theophany or an appearance of God, a powerful moment in salvific history, there are these images of archangels and trumpets and clouds. In Daniel, there's the famous scene of the Son of Man coming on the clouds. Again, these images are very familiar to uh, the Jewish people. And so there's an expectation of a powerful return of Christ to vindicate His people in salvation and in judgment. We spoke about that last week. I said I wanted to develop it a little more this week. And as you see throughout the Old Testament, you'll see these images of God's, the promise of God's return. The minor prophets over and over talk about the trumpet sounding and God bringing judgment or bringing salvation. And so we see this throughout the Old Testament. So Paul is using an image like this, isn't he? He's saying this should be familiar to anyone who knows the Bible, that there is a day in which God calls for His people to be ready in holiness, to be ready for His return, to be awaiting the sound of the trumpets and the rolling in of clouds and a visible and audible glory. All of these things are familiar to us if we know the Old Testament. It's interesting, again, this day of the Lord that is so strongly uh, shown over and over again in the Old Testament is how Paul chooses to tie in what's happening that he's speaking about here. Some people try to separate them and say, well, this rapture or this harpazo is separate. The, the parousia is separate from the day of the Lord, and yet Paul connects them right here directly. End of chapter 4 and beginning of chapter 5. And just so you remember, those chapter divisions are not in the original text. It just flowed right from one to the other. Paul is saying, I'm talking about the return of Christ, and you're asking about the times and the seasons, brethren. Here's what I want to tell you about this. You know that the day of the Lord comes as a thief in the night. And so again, Paul looks at a people who are under distress, under lupeo, distress of wondering about the coming of Christ and what it will mean for those who have died in the faith. And Paul answers them by telling them, there's a promise that we've been holding on to. Our people, now many of the people in the church at Thessalonica are Greek, right? They are, uh, they are Gentiles, but there are also some Jews. He says they can tell you about this promise that we've long held to, the promise of the day of the Lord. That's what we're talking about here when Christ shall return in both judgment and vindication. Now there's another picture here, and I spoke about it last Sunday morning, but it needs to be reiterated. There's a Greek picture. If we've seen a Hebrew picture, there's a Greek picture of this parousia. In fact, uh, the word that we use here, parousia, is actually a Greek word. It's a word that had a strong meaning in the times of Paul, the days of Paul. It was used mostly for the coming of the emperor, the coming of Caesar. If you had lived in Thessalonica and someone had heard you talking about the parousia of Christ, they just heard you saying the parousia of the king, they would have said, oh, he's talking about Caesar. Is Caesar coming to Thessalonica? Because if Caesar is coming, I need to know and I've got to get ready. I've got to greet him. I've got to be ready for it. We see this today, don't we? If the president announces he's coming to town, you're going to have most people getting ready either to protest or to celebrate, right? You see it even today. People are prepared. They hear an important figure's coming. It's like this all over the world as leaders come. Of course, if Caesar was coming to town, you prepared a year in advance. Every detail was made ready. The streets were cleaned. The shops were cleaned. You would not let Caesar enter Thessalonica and see it not ready for the king to appear. I mentioned uh, last week that in this picture of the parousia, there was a, a picture, wasn't there, of people being prepared to go out of the town and meet Caesar and walk into town with him. A greeting committee, if you will. And I said it's interesting that what Paul is talking about here fits with that image as well. That God is going to call us up to meet him in the air. Now there is much that can be said about that imagery uh, because the air is in uh, Jewish culture and biblical culture is seen as the domain of demons, right? Christ is calling his people in conquest, in victory over the powers of this world gathering together, uh, defeating the power of the prince of the air. Again, elements here that would signal victory over and over again. Now again, the parallels, just like in Exodus, are not perfect. Uh, in the 
uh, parousia of the ancient world, you would have walked out to meet Caesar. You would have walked out. Now, you really didn't have much choice in the matter. Uh, if you wanted to lose your head, you might stay at home and not go greet Caesar. But that's not exactly what Paul's saying here, is that you're not choosing to go up into the sky. I mean, you put your faith in the Lord, but he's calling you up. He's whisking you up into the air, into the sky to meet him. So again, the parallels are not perfect, but you can see that this would have been understood by the people in Paul's day. If we're going to prepare for Caesar, surely we need to prepare for the King of kings and the Lord of lords. If we're going to bow a knee to Caesar, then how much more should we recognize the glory and lordship of Christ? I mentioned last Sunday that I think for many people who were persecuted, they were persecuted because they wouldn't bend a knee to Caesar, right? They wouldn't bend a knee to Caesar. And can you imagine the hope that it filled their hearts with to know that they were being persecuted? Maybe some of those that had died were killed. And yet they say, when our king returns, it'll be you bowing a knee to our king. My friends, this was a glorious thing they were thinking about. The day when Christ returns in power and glory, salvation and judgment, and calls his people up to meet him. Now, there is nothing in, in this picture, in either picture, of it being hidden. And I think we need to see this because there's much debate, isn't there, over the nature of the rapture. Is it a secret rapture or an open rapture? Well, Paul is not giving a picture here of a secret rapture. When you think about what he's talking about here, you see power and glory and evidence of his, his power being seen. Thundering sounds, if you will, uh, calling out, pictures of Christ coming down in the clouds and the people being called up to meet him in the clouds. My friends, both tra traditions that Paul is giving us here talk about public celebrations of the power and glory of the King of Kings. The Hebraic picture of the people gathering before the thunderings of Mount Sinai and the, the crowds going out and celebrating the arrival of Caesar, neither one are quiet or secret. And that brings us to our second point, that day's audible announcement. If it's not made clear by the overarching pictures, it should be cleared up by the audible details that Paul includes in this passage to the Thessalonian believers and to us. Paul chooses to describe the return of the Lord in audible terms, terms that would be heard, clearly heard, distinctly heard, sound pictures with a long history in apocalyptic literature, particularly Jewish apocalyptic, apocalyptic literature. They are sound pictures that would be understood uh, properly by probably all people in that era, but particularly Jewish people would have understood them. When Christ returns at his parousia, there will be Three great sounds, Paul says. Three great sounds. Now, there may be other sounds. There may be cheers of the Lord's people as they see Him come in glory, but Paul doesn't mention that. There are three sounds I think are so powerful and dominant, no one can miss them. No one can miss them. The first one that he says is that the Lord Himself descends with a shout. Now, my friends, I don't know how you picture that, but I don't picture some wimpy shout. I don't picture the Lord coming down with a, hey. My Lord is the Lion of Judah. My friends, I think we're going to hear a roar that day. A roar that day. That word, kelusma, actually means not only a loud noise, but a shout of command. A shout of command. In Jewish apocalyptic literature, it was like the giving of military orders or an authoritative rebuke. And usually it had elements of both. Orders to the people of God and a rebuke against the enemies of God. That's the way the prophets pictured this. And so my friends, again, this picture is seen as more than just the collecting of the people of God, but a definitive moment of judgment and vindication and salvation. The second sound is the voice of an archangel the voice of the archangel. Now, before we move on into what that voice would mean, it would behoove us to consider the presence of an archangel. Now, we think often of angels, and we hear about archangels, but do we think about what archangels represent? They represent the God of order, don't they? That the God who ordered the world, who ordered his creation, the God who ordered 
society by giving us rulers. That's what it says in Romans 13. The God who ruled the household by giving a family structure. The God who ruled the church by giving elders and deacons and structure the church. The same God has ordered even the heavenly places. If there are angels, there is going to be structure and order to angels. There will be angels and there will be archangels above them to order the orders of angels. And they will all be under the lordship of God. So my friends, this speaks of the God of order even in the heavenly places. In Jewish literature, the presence of archangels would almost always signal the coming of angels. Now that would directly tie to 2 Thessalonians. I know I'm jumping a little bit ahead here, but if you turn to 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, look at what he says here. Paul says uh, we can, it's a long sentence here, but let's just jump to about verse 7. He says, And to give you who are troubled rest with us when the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven with his mighty angels. So Paul's talking about this again, isn't he? The coming of Christ. And he says, he's not coming alone. He's going to be accompanied by his army of angels. But if those angels are going to be there, certainly the archangels are going to be there because they are ordering this thing. They are in God's perfect order. They will also be there. They're the leaders of those angels under God's authority. It's interesting because if you turn to other places, you see the same thing. In Matthew chapter 25, verse 31, Jesus says, When the Son of Man comes in His glory and all the angels with Him, then He will sit on His glorious throne. So if there's a huge number of angels, we would expect archangels. But the presence of all of this is even more significant in apocalyptic literature. The shout of the archangel commanding the legions of angels is seen throughout the pages of apocalyptic literature as a decisive militaristic act, directing the activity of the angels, if you will. So when the archangels shout, they are giving the orders for what the angels are to do. And the angels are very active, very active in this. Now, if you want to turn for just a moment to Mark chapter 13, just for a second, I want you to look at the Olivet Discourse. And what Jesus says about this. Mark 13, 24 through 27. If you walk through our Easter devotionals, by the way, day by day, uh, we, we really didn't get to get into the Olivet Discourse. It's so uh, complicated and, and uh, worthy of its own segment that we didn't tackle it. But here's a portion of it. Let's begin in verse 24. But in those days, Jesus says, after the tribulation, the sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light. The stars of heaven will fall and the powers in the heavens will be shaken. Then they will see the Son of Man coming in the clouds with great power and glory. And then he will send his angels and gather together his elect from the four winds, from the farthest part of the earth to the farthest part of heaven. Now, my friends, again, you see the involvement of the angels in all of these end times pictures that were given. So we shouldn't be surprised that Paul uh, thinks it's important to note that one of the sounds that will be heard on that great and glorious day is the shout of the archangel. Now, a lot of people try to figure out which archangel we're talking about here, and there's a lot of speculation. Is it Michael? Who is it? Paul didn't give us that detail. The Lord didn't uh, need for us to know this, to know what we need to know. So I, I don't think we should speculate too much on this. But again, what will we hear that day? We'll hear the shout of command of Almighty God, and we will hear the voice of an archangel. But there's a third sound that Paul says we should expect on that last day, and that is the sound of the trumpet of Almighty God. The trumpet of Almighty God. Now, my friends... Uh, Again, the trumpet is seen throughout the revelation of Scripture as being a time when God is announcing something or calling your attention or giving some important order. Now, one thing we know about a trumpet is what? It's not designed to go unheard. The purpose of a trumpet is that you would hear it. In fact, a trumpet is so uh, noticeable in its sound that it's used to wake up, at least in the old days, soldiers, right? They would Blow the bugle or trumpet outside to waken soldiers. It is a tool to waken up. And that's even in the ancient world. A trumpet would be sounded to awaken the soldiers on a day of battle. 
in case you think that would be incidental language, I would remind you that part of what Paul will argue in chapter 5 connected to this day is don't be found asleep. Don't be found snoozing. Don't be found unprepared or unawares. Uh, Be ready for when Christ returns. My friends, a trumpet carries a lot of imagery with it. Some of it militaristic. In the ancient uh, world, they didn't have walkie-talkies. They didn't have radios. How did they communicate orders? Well, through trumpets, through drums, things like this. If you wanted an advance, you had a certain uh, way you would blow the trumpet. If you wanted them to halt or retreat, there was a different sounding of the trumpet. All of these things were known to the people. In fact, if you think about it, even as late as the Revolutionary War period, they used drums in a similar way to regulate the footsteps of the soldiers, to tell them when to attack, when to march forward, how fast to march forward. These are what you did in the ancient world before you had mass communications. So there are strong militaristic tones here, but there's also royal significance. When Caesar came to town, it wasn't a silent event. The trumpets were blowing, announcing the royal presence. You even see that in uh, our cartoonish looks at royalty. You know, stuff like that, right? You announce the king. When Christ returns, it won't be silent. That's what he's saying. It won't be unheard or unnoticed. Paul says there is vivid imagery here of something that will be heard, something that will be noticed, that will catch some asleep, but they won't miss it. This isn't the only place where Paul uses language like this. I'm going to ask you to turn one more place. 1 Corinthians 15. I wanted to stay as much as I could in 1 Thessalonians because Paul wrote everything he wanted the Thessalonians to hear right there in that text. But there are some strong parallels we have to look at, and this is a very strong one. You may remember in the Corinthian church there is also a question about resurrection. And Paul says, uh, why are you asking? Why are you doubting that there'll be a resurrection? If Christ arose, you also will rise. And then he says this. Now this I say, brethren, this is verse 50, by the way, of 15, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. Now, Paul explains why that is. You cannot enter the kingdom of God in your current body. Why? Because your current body is sown in corruption. It's sick. It's corrupted. It is not glorified. It cannot have any place in the kingdom of God, in the the eschatological, if you will, kingdom of God. And I, for one, am thankful to God for that. I don't want this body for all eternity. But what he says is that there's something we need to hear. If flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, he wants to know the principle for that. Nor does corruption inherit incorruption. For if incorruption has... Corruption, it's no longer incorruption, is it? Behold, I tell you a mystery, Paul says. A mystery. Something that you wouldn't know if God didn't reveal it to you. We shall not all sleep, but praise God, we shall all be changed. Notice the connection here to 1 Thessalonians. Paul is saying when Christ returns, there will be some who are dead in Christ. That is the way it works. We live and we die. But there will be some who are living when Christ returns. Paul says, we shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. Listen to this. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at when? The last trumpet. The last trumpet. And what is the result of it? For the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised incorruptible. Praise the Lord. And we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. So when this corruptible has put on incorruption, and this mortal has put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is your sting? O Hades, where is your victory? For the sting of death is sin. And the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Wow. 
Notice the parallels. There are some living, there are some dead. Those that are dead will be raised, not back to their former bodies, to incorruptible, glorified bodies. And those who are living will be changed in the twinkling of an eye. And there is no order of ascent. Paul tells us in 1 Thessalonians, we looked at this last Sunday, they'll be raised first. Why? So that we can all go up together to meet the Lord in the air. And Paul says, and thus we shall ever be with the Lord. We shall ever be with the Lord. Now, my friends, I think it's hard for me, reading what Paul is saying here, to rectify this with the idea of a secret rapture that nobody notices. Christ is coming back in power and glory with shouts and trumpets and archangels. The dead are rising in Christ and ascending to meet the Lord in the air. In this act that uh, the biblical record ties into judgment and salvation. My friends, I, I don't think we're going to miss this. Well, we in Christ are definitely not going to miss it. I don't think anybody's going to miss it. I think everybody's going to see this, and your response is going to be either celebration and awe or terror. Terror. My friends, I think that's what Paul's concern is here. Not that we would understand exactly whether or not the position is amillennialism or premillennialism or postmillennialism. Those things are important. Anything in which we're studying God's Word is important. I'm not downplaying any of that. But Paul's charge here is to be ready. To be ready. And I think we have to be careful about being too dogmatic on these things anyway. Nobody really accurately predicted how Christ would come in His first coming. I mean, God knew, but none of the scholars understood it. The key was, when He came, did you recognize Him? Did you worship Him? Did you fall to your knees before the living Christ, the true and living God? My friends, the important thing here is, when Christ returns, are you ready? Are you snoozing? Are you like the rest of the world on autopilot, thinking, as in the psalm we read earlier, there's no judgment coming? I'll just go on living as I've always lived according to my own will and power, not concerned at all about what God will one day do when He comes in power. Paul's question is, are you ready for Christ's return? Again, that day, that day is going to be a glorious day. For those in Christ, when you see Christ return, it will be glorious. And I don't even think it's going to be, I mean, there's going to be a healthy fear of the Lord, right? I mean, when you hear that trumpet sound, it's going to get your attention. It may startle you for a second. But when you recognize what's happening, it's going to be exciting. It's going to be glorious to see our Lord descending from heaven and to see uh, those who have died uh, before us in the faith, raised in incorruption and us changing the twinkling of an eye. It's going to be glorious. For those in Christ, it'll be the greatest day in history. But my friends, Paul wants us not to forget that for some it'll be the most awful day in human history. For those who are found on the wrong side of the only dividing line that matters in human history. My friends, we shouldn't forget that. That is the reason we evangelize. That is the reason we tell others about Christ, that they wouldn't be caught unawares on the wrong side of the line, if you will, on that glorious day. So, brothers and sisters, I'm going to close the way I think Paul would close, which is by asking you, are you on the right side of that line? Are you ready if he comes back today or tomorrow? Are you ready to meet Jesus Christ, the King of glory? Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. We know, Father, that for many this is a fearful text. To think about the age ending in power. To think about your return in glory and holiness. But Father, we also know that this was meant as words of comfort to your church that no matter what we face in the evils of this world, this world will not last forever as it is.
but that there is a day when all evil will be judged, when you return in glory and your people are changed in the twinkling of an eye and we will be with you forevermore. Father, I pray that if there was a person here today that did not know that they were a part of that promise, if their heart was being stirred up today, I pray today would be the day, Father, that they would recognize that their only hope is in Christ Jesus. That there is no amount of good deeds that we can do. That there is no climbing enough on the ladder of life to reach the glories of that day. But that you invite us into that day by your grace, as we trust in Christ. Father, I pray that for those of us who are here this morning, who are yours, that we would rejoice to know that this is a promise for us, but that we would, like Paul, also be concerned that there are others who are not a part of this promise. And have that motivate us that we would want to proclaim Jesus to those who have not heard of Him, or to those who do not know Him. Father, help us be a people who live as Paul calls us to, as a people who recognize that this world will not go on forever and evermore. We don't know how long it will go on, but there is a day in which human history will come to an end as it is now. Father, help us to rejoice if we are on the right side of that line of salvation in Christ, but help us in recognizing this terrible picture of judgment to be a people who desire to tell others that they may flee the wrath that is to come. Father, we love you and we thank you for your grace. We pray that Christ is honored in all that we do and say. It's in his name we pray this morning. Amen. If you would, please stand as we sing our closing hymn, hymn 209, Rock of Ages, and we will sing the first and third verses of hymn 209. microphone on now um, amen what a great uh, song that is to uh, to close with that speaks about what we were just praying about right there's nothing in our hands we bring simply to the cross of Christ we cling my friends I'm glad you're here this morning it's so good to be back together uh, I, I am so thankful I say this over and over but I'm thankful that we have video cameras and audio recorders but it's it's just not a real good substitute is it for the gathering of the Lord's people so I'm glad you're here today And uh, remember, we'll be back next Sunday and we'll continue in 1 Thessalonians looking at these promises and what Paul desires that we would learn about it. And uh, again, what great and glorious promises they are to those in Christ. And I believe that's to be a comfort to us, but also a motivation that we would tell others about our glorious King while there's time. time. Again, I want to thank you for being here. I'm going to ask if Brother Cole will close us with a word of prayer.